Uh, my name is Charles Rotimi, and um, I'm the director for the Center for Genomics and Global Health. I'm also the branch chief for the cardiovascular uh, metabolic and inflammatory disease branch within the NHGRI intramural program. So I direct uh, a team of um, multidisciplinary investigators uh, who are interested in understanding um, you know, disease distribution in different populations. I was born in Benin City in Nigeria, uh, where I did most of my growing up. And uh, I went to uh, my high school and uh, initial training as a biochemist at the University of Benin uh, in Nigeria. Uh, before migrating to the, uh, to the United States for further studies. After graduating um, in biochemistry from the University of Benin, uh, then you're required to do one year of national service, which is basically a combination of military training and also serving the nation. So after completing that one year, um, I applied to universities in the UK and also in the US. And uh, interestingly, I was uh, as accepted um, into the uh, University of Manchester in the UK to study uh, petrochemical engineering. And uh, I was also, uh, also accepted to the University of uh, uh, Mississippi uh, in uh, Ole Miss, you know, in uh, Oxford, Mississippi, to again continue my biochemistry in, in terms of food nutrition. Uh, so it was um, a very interesting thing. I presented both. Uh, to my parents. I'm from a very humble home, um, so I wasn't at all sure that my parents would have the resources uh, to send me to abroad for further studies. So it was, um, I was presently surprised uh, when my mother, who's uh, a trader, uh, said uh, she could afford to pay for one year. Uh, it turns out that the U.S. university fees was slightly lower than that of the UK. So that's actually what made the decision for me to come to the United States instead of going to the UK for petrochemical engineering. And uh, so one year school fees was paid for me and um, I was basically on my own after that uh, in the US. So my initial socialization to the American culture was actually at the uh, University of Mississippi uh, where I got my initial uh, master's degree in healthcare administration. Uh, before going to Birmingham, Alabama, uh, to study epidemiology. My doctoral thesis really was actually quite interesting. It's, it's quite removed from what I'm doing now. Uh, it was actually looking at um, the, the, the impact of um, working in a foundry and an engine plant, a Ford Motor Company foundry and engine plant in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, in relation to lung cancer and stomach cancer. So the union was uh, then was um, a little bit uh, worried that their workers were experiencing higher rates of stomach and lung cancer. So my supervisors then at University of uh, uh, Alabama were given the uh, contract, you know, to study to determine if this is really true and if there's excess is it actually due to occupational exposure or something, you know, uh, that people you know, are doing at home or some combination of this. So that was what my PhD thesis was on. Uh, it was basically using epidemiological methods to look at um, uh, re records and determine what kind of exposure. First of all, to determine was there increased risk, and if there was, why? Um, and, and I say it was a very fascinating uh, you know, uh, study. My story is one of those that uh, really highlight the fact that there's really no one path, you know, to where you're going to become in future. I, right after graduating from um, uh, University of Alabama, I got a postdoctoral position at Loma Linda University in California. So then I had a little Honda uh, Civic that uh, I drove across the country uh, because I couldn't afford, you know, the other you know, modes of transportation to start my postdoctoral work again, um, you know, with my family. And that was actually very fascinating. I was look, I was working with uh, a PI there who was studying Alzheimer's disease, and that's what we were working on. One of the things I love about training epidemiology is, is, is once you understand the fundamental methods, uh, you can actually apply it to any disease. Uh, you know, so it was uh, quite comfortable for me uh, to be able to do my postdoctoral. Uh, work within that uh, Loma Linda University, which is a very, very a wonderful university.
Uh, but the, I think probably the more in interesting part of that story is really why I was there. Um, I saw this ad one evening uh, in the paper by Richard Cooper. And, you know, that says that uh, they're looking for somebody who would be interested in studying uh, hypertension, um, you know, in um, the African diaspora, in different African populations, and that he was interested in an epidemiologist, you know. So the way the ad was written, it was absolutely very fascinating. So I, I called Richard and I said, Richard, you must have written this ad with me in mind. I said, because this is exactly what I want to do. You know, so he, um, he you know, invited me for an interview and, um, and I accepted the job. So I moved from, I didn't complete my postdoctoral work, so I moved from Loma Linda to Loyola Medical Center uh, in the suburb of Chicago. Uh, and that's when I started really, you know, studying and understanding uh, head disparity and how to use the migrational design of the African experience, African diaspora experience, to shed light on why disease vary as you go from rural Nigeria or rural West African countries, you know, to uh, to the Caribbean and to the U.S. Yeah. When we started, uh, we really wanted to understand. First of all, what is the prevalence of hypertension as you go across these different populations who share very recent ancestry? You know, so we wanted to understand that. And then once we understand what the prevalence was, we wanted to see if we can shed light on some of the factors that are driving uh, this uh, you know, different prevalence as you go across these uh, uh, different African you know, populations. You know, so, we uh, put together, again, Richard wrote the initial grant, you know, to, to do this, and uh, it was to enroll over 10,000 individuals, and we were quite happy to have been able to do that in a very, very rigorous way. We, we standardized the procedure because ha blood pressure is one of those things that vary quite a bit, so we needed to make sure that you are using the same procedure across the different sites, otherwise you won't be able to compare results, you know. So there was a lot of standardization that went through that process, and we were able to uh, come up with data for over 10,000 individuals uh, from Nigeria. Uh, we have urban and rural sites in Nigeria. And in Cameroon, we also had urban and rural sites. Then in the Caribbean, we have St. Lucia, Barbados, and Jamaica. And of course, African Americans in the Chicago area, Maywood, Illinois. You know. So the, the finding you know, from this study really shed you know, fundamental insight into the impact of the environment that people find themselves on blood pressure and hypertension you know, distribution. So it was very clear that it varied from about 7% in rural West Africa to about 16% in the urban centers like Ibadan, Lagos, and then to about 26% among the, uh, the uh, black nations of the Caribbean and uh, over 34% you know, among African Americans in the Chicago area. So you had this very, almost a monotonous increase in blood pressure and hypertension uh, prevalence as you go from rural Africa, you know, to urban, uh, you know, uh, Chicago via the Caribbean, uh, you know. So it was very, very fascinating, uh, you know, to, to, for us to find that. And then we shared lights also on that that gradient that, you, that we were able to establish was due uh, we were able to explain close to 60% of that variant by looking at things like salt intake, you know, how heavy you are, you know, and also level of physical activity, you know. So, tr you know, so you see the impact on the environment, you know, was really, really well demonstrated, uh, you know, in that study. Yeah. That does not mean that there are no genetic susceptibility, uh, but if you are actually comparing and trying to understand head disparity, then I think the, you, you would get a much bigger bang for your money by looking at the environmental factors that drive these conditions, yes. That's a very important question because one of the major challenges in doing even genetic study is the ability to characterize the environment. Um, I, I would say that at some point in all of this stuff, even in genomic studies, the rate limiting step is really going to be the ability to characterize the environment because that is what is always changing. Um, you know, and you have to be able to do that very well. So for us, one of the things that we were uh, able to do uh, was to measure things like 
uh, height and weight, you would think that measuring height would be a very straightforward uh, phenomenon. It is absolutely not. Uh, for example, during one, one of our studies, we lost a lot of data points just because the interviewer who was measuring individuals did not tell people to straighten up against the wall so we can use the stadiometer to measure their height. So some, some, some people slouch. So a lot of people were very short, you know, for their weight. So their body mass index was really high. And then you have some women, because in Nigeria, women wear head, headgear. So, and the headgear can be sometimes up to six inches. You know, so some of the uh, interviewers did not tell the women to take off their headgear before they were measured. So they were much taller than, than what, they, what they're supposed to be, uh, their true height is. So those, all of those cause major problems you know, in terms of your ability to measure. So things as simple as height can get very complicated if you don't standardize the procedure and you don't train very well. You know. And the other thing also, uh, there are some environmental factors that are really difficult, things like diet, for example, when we wanted to characterize salt, um, our, we felt that our best measure, because we were not dietitians, our best measure would be to look at it from a biochemical parameter point of view. And that is, so we collected urine samples. And from the urine samples, we were able to measure, you know, uh, you know sodium potassium. And that gave us idea as to consumption. So we were using excretion to approximate intake. Uh, you know, so you have to be clever about how you how you do you know do some of this uh, stuff. And then we collect things like education, income, occupation, uh, which are again are very very uh, you know important. In terms of the consent aspect, I, one of the things that we did very well, I, I, I think, is that we engaged the community and also the community leaders, and we ma made it clear what our intentions were and why we are doing what we are doing. And, uh, you know, to let people know that for the very first time, we are contributing to people's understanding of why some people get high blood pressure and others don't. And how do we study this at the population level so that we can make recommendations in terms of preventive strategy and, and also for people to just be aware of the fact that the fact that you don't feel anything doesn't mean your blood pressure is not high. Uh -huh, you know, so... Uh, by doing that, I think we brought the community along. And another plus in doing studies like places like Nigeria, uh, Cameroon, in, you know, and in Caribbean is that people are still very receptive to research. Uh, and uh, so it's not it's too complicated to get people excited about, you know, doing this kind of study. Uh, so that helped in our ability to be able to recruit people. And then another major factor is we employed people who actually live in those communities. So the participants in this study know the people who are working in the clinics and the people who are knocking on their doors and asking them to come and participate in the study. So that was also very, very useful in doing to have familiar faces out there, uh, you know, who people can relate to. Yeah. Mm. Yes, there has been some very uh, bad history in terms of biomedical research. Uh, in the African-American experience. Uh, and therefore, people are skeptical, uh, which is, I think, rightfully so, uh, that people should be skeptical. But one of the things that uh, we do, I do in my study, is basically to train my um, um, community liaison research, you know, um, assistants uh, who go into the community to be aware of this history, not to run away from it, understand it, and explain it to people, and then more importantly, let people know what are the things that we have put in place to make sure that the likelihood of something like Tuskegee occurring is much more reduced now. You know, so it's, 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 I think for me it's important to acknowledge it, but to also let people know that that should not be a reason not to participate in biomedical research because the community will, will be the loser uh, in the long run. But what you need to do is when you're participating in research, have your eyes wide open. Uh, the fact that I have a dark skin like you doesn't, you don't, it doesn't mean that you should trust me. Uh, you should still ask questions just like you ask anybody um, and uh, make sure that uh, the right things have been put in place. First of all, you make sure that my study has been approved uh, by the appropriate authority and that you have somebody to call if you feel that anything is going wrong with the study that you don't like.
and that person should be independent of the study itself, of the study personnel. So we explain all of those things, and we let people know of why, why, they have to, why they need to participate in study like this, especially in genetic studies. You know, and when, when you feel uncomfortable at any point in the process, stop. You know, and, uh, but if you see that the study is going on in the way that you like, you should participate because that is the only way we can understand what is going on in your community. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I also observe, um, you know, with my mentor Richard Cooper when we're doing all these studies is that when you see somebody who is diabetic or hypertensive, they tend to have this, the other condition. So if you see somebody who is diabetic, they tend to also be hypertensive, they tend to also be obese. You know, and so uh, for me, it, it made absolute sense to try to study this condition. So for, I started looking at my whole research, not in the, in the context of these very specific diseases, but looking at it as a metabolic disorders, you know. Uh, so bringing them together, you know. So I looked at uh, hypertension, obesity, and, and diabetes as a triangle, you know, and they feed into each other. And uh, our ability to, to understand how these things are related, I think, will shed tremendous light on how we prevent it, how we, how we treat it, and how we even communicate uh, to people about their condition. You know? So to me, that was absolutely um, the way to go in terms of my own research, you know, um, in research activities. So I started with Richard Cooper with terms of the hypertension, and we saw the impact of obesity. Um, and, then, during that process, um, we, st we started talking from uh, this whole discussion about diabetes started actually with Francis Collins and, uh, and uh, Georgia Dunstein. So Georgia Dunstein, uh, who's a professor at Howard University, uh, you know, was doing a sabbatical in uh, Francis Collins' lab at the NIH. And, um, and, but before then, Francis has done the missionary work in Nigeria, where he treated quite a few diabetic patients. And uh, so I think that stuck with him for a long time. So when the opportunity came about in terms of discussing how can we study diabetes in, in uh, West Africa uh, with Georgia in his lab, so there was a discussion about how do we move this forward. And um, so I was brought into that picture as an investigator who is doing work in Africa uh, to see how we can put together a study that will shed light on, first of all, what is the risk of diabetes and what are the factors that are contributing to diabetes from the environmental point of view and also from genetic point of view. Uh, so that's how the diabetes component, uh, you, know, uh, you know, started uh, in, in a sense. At that time, I was already very, very interested on, on the genetic contributions, you know, to these various diseases because we studied from the EPI point of view, and we wanted, we saw that there were still some pains that we noticed. For example, why is it that you tend to see hypertension run in certain families, and oh no, diabetes run in some families and not in others? So there was aspect of what we were studying that was not completely you know, explained by environmental factors. So we wanted again to bring genetics to bear on that. So. Uh, I think to cut a long story short, I accepted you know, uh, to come to Howard University to lead the genetic epidemiology unit and I tend to be the director of the genetic epidemiology. So the genome center there you know, had four major areas. It had genetic epidemiology, it had statistical genetics that was led by George uh, Burney, and it had molecular you know, genetics, uh, which again was led by uh, Georgia Dunstein and Rick Kittles, and then it had uh, you know, uh, ethics that was led by Charmaine Royal. Uh, so those were the, and it was a very, very successful center, you know, then, uh, you know, we attracted a lot of research fundings, and we did quite a bit of um, what, I, what I consider very good work in shedding lights on genetic and environmental determinants of different diseases, cancer, diabetes, hypertension, you know, and, uh, and, uh, across, you know, the African diaspora. There are several toolkits, and um, I think depending on, on your approach and how you want to, and also the state of technology it tends to be very, very critical. Uh, because when I started out, you know, in terms of trying to look at the genetic, you know, um, contributions to these diseases, uh, at some point we were, we were able to look at one gene at a time and, um, you know, do some, you know, basic, uh, you know, 
you know, SNPs, you know, in this, uh, in this uh, genes. And, um, you know, we call that the candidate gene approach, uh, you know, then. And then, of course, with, um, with more markers, you know, coming in you know, as a result of things like the half map, and we're able to do uh, linkage studies, uh, you know, which, you know, basically, you know, helps you to determine regions in the chromosome that is tracking the disease, you know, in, in, in families, you know, uh, you know, basically. And, uh, it's, again, it's based on the, the principle that, uh, things that are related together, that are close together on the chromosome, you know, stick together uh, during the meiosis, you know, in the sense they are not broken up. So you can use the marker to track, you know, that chromosomal region. And if you see a signal, then you can do more work within that region to see if you can actually localize the specific gene. Uh, in that. So there's, there was the linkage uh, study. And then there's your association study uh, also. Uh, which basically is, you know, you're looking at people who have the disease and people who don't have the disease, and you are trying to see, do I see an increased risk when I look at these people, and or decreased risk, so it can be susceptibility or resistance. Uh -huh. And then you, you basically that is based on having a large number of people who have who are cases, and large number of people who are controls, and um, and you you do your association study and um, and use statistics to see what's the relationship, and see if that relationship is significant, and then you make in your you make your inference. But all of this you know association study became actually practical, as a result of the sequencing of the human genome and the subsequent spin-offs like the HAP map and the thousand genome, because we couldn't do it you know cost effectively enough uh -huh, before before all of these things you know uh, you know came about so those are some of the 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 the, the, um, the tools that we have you know to map you know these various diseases the complex diseases what we call complex diseases or diseases are not that are not mendelian uh, which are basically as a result of multiple genes and multiple environmental factors are pretty difficult to track, uh, you know, because you're not just, it's not just one gene, and it's, it's not just one environment. It's the constellation of different things coming together to increase risk or decrease risk, you know. So it's a quite challenging, uh, you know, a process. Yeah. But the, the challenge, you know, is really how do you begin to tease all of this apart in a way that you actually are able to quantify your risk, my risk, uh, if we carry these markers, and maybe uh, in, in the end, design drug targets, you know, for for these various, uh, you know, uh, uh, genetic markers in a way that you can actually treat people or come up with better medications. It's a very very difficult thing, you know. We all know, even at our own personal level, we all know. Sometimes you know you know the, the reality, but you just are not able to implement some of these things changes uh, to take advantage of the information you're getting. But I think the the basic thing is letting people understand the concept of risk and the concept of probability. Okay, and it, that it is a chance. You can come from the various activity that people engage in on a daily basis. You know, that if you have a deck of cards and you have more of the cards that are similar, you see, your likelihood of picking that card that are more than one in the deck is higher. Okay? So if you, you, so you start with that concept. So basically what you're saying is when we find people who have 10 types of this type of uh, genes, their risk of diabetes is much higher. Okay? And what that means, it doesn't mean that they are going to get diabetes tomorrow or that. What that means is if they put in place, you know, things like reduce your weight, do more physical activity, watch what you eat, that they might indeed be able to overcome that genetic load that they carry. Uh, but it's something that you have to do for the rest of your life. It's not just you do it for one month and, and you, you, know, you give it up. But you have to maintain an ideal weight and, and um, you know, eat properly and, and do your physical activity. But we also have to be realistic when we are communicating that. And there are some people that if you have a very strong family history, that you may be able to postpone when this disease will occur, but you may not be able to prevent it completely. So we have to go through all of these dynamics and all of these ways of explaining risk and probability
uh, to people in a way that people can understand it and implement it in their daily life. So I think it's an issue really of education and communication. So it's not just the scientists at this point. You have to bring in people who actually have the skills to be able to communicate, you know, um, no risk, you know, to individuals. So it's, it's again a very daunting, uh, you know, process. The Juno Wide Association study, what we call GWAS, um, is it, really, I think, one of those fundamental tools that have really changed biomedical research, you know, in a way of looking for disease gene association. It's really revolutionized, you know, what we can do. And that came about because of our efforts in, in the HapMap project, the International Haplotype Mapping Project. Because before then, you couldn't really interrogate the genome. It was too expensive, you know, uh, you know, to do. It wasn't practical. And we really even didn't have an idea of all the markers that you could use to do that kind of study, you know. So investing in the HapMap project uh, at the national and international level really led to the genome-wide association revolution, uh, in a sense. Um, and it le also led to the ability of the um, man biotech companies to be able to develop these um, uh, genotyping arrays uh, in a way that they could, they could be used from one study to another uh, in a more cost-friendly uh, you know, manner. I was involved in this question right from the beginning. I, and um, um, I, I, we recognized that, again, given the evolutionary history of, of humans, that you know, we all started somewhere, our ancestors started somewhere in Africa and uh, before we migrated to different parts of the world. And because of that, you just have more variation, you know, in, in, in African people. So it made absolute sense that if you were going to characterize uh, human genetic variation that you have, that the African population is, is represented in that effort. So there was, right from the very beginning, that there was a discussion to at least represent some of the continental diversity that we currently have, given limited resources. We all knew that that wasn't the complete answer uh, to all of this, but we needed to start somewhere. And, and, and uh, those four populations, you know, the Yoruba, Japanese, and Chinese, and also European, were initially put together, uh, you know, in terms of the half mile project. So I was involved in that discussion of which population to sample uh, from Africa. So I was the PI of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of engaging the African community for the haplotype mapping project. And I did that with my colleagues. Um, and we were able to engage the Yoruba community in the Badon area in Nigeria to participate uh, in, the, in this effort. That was my very first <coughs> full community engagement activity uh, to really tell people why they need to participate in this study and to hear from them why they may want to or why they may not want to to participate in that effort. So again, right from the very beginning, I think we were very you know, cognizant of this whole, uh, these various aspects of the project that needed to be brought to bear. One of the distinction between the HapMap project and the diversity project you know, is really the fact that we wanted the HapMap to be biomedical research based. It, has, it, it was health. Our, we are designing a tool to help us understand human health and disease. Uh, not necessarily the, 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 what I'll call the other gains came later in terms of population genetics and all that. But the main focus was how do we characterize the human genome in a way that it will become a tool for us to be able to understand health and disease. That was really the driving force behind. And that set a half map aside from all of that you know, diversity project, uh, or variation project that was going on at that point in time. You know, and, and also, that also helped us when we were make, doing the community uh, engagement to be absolutely clear you know, to people why we are asking them to participate in this study and what their resources will be used for. Again, the process was really identifying, you know, key uh, investigators who, you know, work with me on this, on this uh, engaging the African community. Uh, for, you know, in the Badon area, for example, engaging the Yoruba, 
the the local PI for that project then was Clement Adebamo, uh, who was a professor of surgery at the, at the university, very close to the community where we were doing this work. Uh, so that was a key a key person. And then I had Charmaine Royal and also Patricia Marshall, who were ethicists and knew uh, and uh, so, uh, you know social uh, scientists who knew how to engage you know uh, you know communities. You know, so it was bringing these forces together that we approached the community. First of all, we identified the elders of that community. We identified the leadership structure of the community. And then we approached them and uh, with uh, the help of uh, Clement Adebamo, and um, you know, we told them about what the study was all about and what we want to put in place to make sure that uh, you know, individuals who participate in the study are protected and uh, for them to actually understand what they are doing and the informed consent that they are going to sign, how the resources are going to be used, how they are going to be broadly shared, and, um, and also the fact that um, no identifying information will, will go with the samples. You know, that even the uh, consent forms that are signed will not come to the U.S., it will stay in Nigeria. And uh, so those samples could never be linked, you know, uh, you know to an individual. Uh, in a sense, you know, so we went through all of that community engagement, letting people know uh, what this study is about. To our own fascination, uh, was when we started talking to people, uh, we were quite uh, surprised as to the level. Scientists tend to want to underestimate the level of understanding of community members. Um, and I think that's a big mistake. Um, you know, the fact that somebody cannot say haplotype doesn't mean that they don't understand what you're doing. You know, so we were very, very surprised as to how people were able to relate back to us. What do they understand the hap map was going to do? I remember very clearly one of the comments made by one of the ladies who were, you know, participating in this uh, community engagement uh, was the fact that. She said, this will enable us, you know, understand how people who left Africa are related to us now. You know, so that was a fundamental way of really articulating what we are going to learn from the half map. To me, I was completely blown, blown away. Uh, when some, somebody we thought, you know, didn't understand what we were saying, can actually put in such simple language. Uh, in, in a way, so we started using that expression ourselves, you know, to explain the half map, you know, uh, you know, to people. So it was absolutely quite fascinating. The whole community engagement was quite uh, uh, interesting. And the other thing I'll say is, don't engage the community if you don't want to hear what they have to say. Uh, you know, because community can tell you things you don't want to, that you didn't think about uh, while you were designing your study, and some of the concerns that they may have. Uh, you know about the study. So when you are doing community engagement, you have to have an open mind and be prepared, you know, to deal with issues that you did not think about as a scientist. She was really the overall coordinator from the NIH point of view, and um, uh, you know, Jane and uh, McQueen and also uh, Lisa, um, you know. So she, Jane, especially, went with us, you know, multiple times to Nigeria. Uh, she participated in the community engagement aspects, uh, and it, so she brought her expertise from the 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 LC, you know, the ethics and all this point of view. And she had a wonderful understanding of the informed consent process and what are the things that need to be put into that document to make sure that people really understand and appreciate how their resources were going to be used. So Jane was there again when we were engaging the community right from the beginning to the end. And uh, she was absolutely uh, invaluable to the whole process, you know, in, in terms of how do you do this, you know, uh, how do we put this in place in a way that we can actually call this community engagement. Um, and I think HapMap set an example that I think is really difficult to beat uh, because up to, up to now, uh, the community advisory, the CAG, the community advisory group, still receive documents from Korea, uh, you know, uh, bio repository in New Jersey about how those resources are used. That is that's unheard of in biomedical research. So the standard that the HAPMAP sets is extremely high um, and, uh, and they have lived up to it you know, so far.
I regard Francis as a mentor, uh, you know, uh, basically for my own career development. Um, and um, we, I have always, you know, seek you know, advice from him and talk to him about things. And, uh, and uh, we have been engaged, you know, again, with the diabetes study and also, of course, with the half map and the thousand genome. And uh, when I was coming to the NIH, it was basically a discussion between myself and Francis uh, in terms of setting up this center that I lead now uh, uh, at NIH. And then uh, we brought in uh, uh, Eric Green then, who was a scientific director uh, at, that, at that point in time. So I, I really do see Francis as a, as a mentor uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in my own career development. And uh, he, of course, he's the, um, uh, one of the brains behind you know, the, the sequencing of the human genome and also the uh, uh, the half map project. I think he had, he had a vision about the fact that we can actually characterize human genetic variation and use it to understand human health. And that, I think, was a driving force, you know, for Francis. Again, I think Francis has, you know, pretty broad based, you know, knowledge, broad knowledge uh, base. And uh, he appreciated the fact that you have Mendelian diseases and you have, you know, complex traits. And um, his own interest in diabetes really, again, is illuminating in that sense, in, in the sense that these are you know, diseases that you need genetic epidemiologists, you know, in the sense of bringing in the environment and bringing in the genetics and try to understand how these things, things influence each other, you know, to increase risk of, of disease. So we really talk from that point of view uh, of, you know, complex traits and also from the point of view of making sure that genomics is a global exercise, not just exercise of rich societies. You know, so Francis is absolutely passionate about that, and that is my own complete passion uh, in the sense that we, whatever gains we are going to get from genomics, that we make sure it's global, that it applies to all human populations. And so when, for example, when we were doing, starting to do uh, the, like the half map project, you know, discussion with Francis and other, we could have sampled Yoruba people in America, okay? It would have been much cheaper, probably very much faster. But I was absolutely opposed to that. And Francis appreciated that you know, completely, that you cannot do something like the Half Man Project if you don't go to where the people you are sampling actually live, you know? And, and how can you actually engage that community and say you've done a community engagement when you are doing their engagement in America, but their, their home is thousands of miles away. So it was pretty clear during that discussion, and Francis appreciated that very well, when I indicated that we have to go back to Africa to make sure that we actually do the community engagement and let people know what those resources are going to be and engage Africans on the African continent, not in other parts of the world. My take on understanding human generation, ge variation period is we have to sample as many human populations as possible, whether they are small or big. If we really, I think we have to cover the breadth and scope, you know, for us to actually fully appreciate wh wh how, what is the complete picture in terms of human genetic variation. So the more population we sample, the more population we genotype or sequence, the more we are going to know about variation. But we also know because the human history is a very, very recent history in relation to other organisms, you know, or at least in relation to, uh, to, 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 the, to the planet you know, itself, that we are we're very, very recent. And because of that recent history, we share a lot of our variation. So very few human populations can adequately represent the, the, you know, the variation up to, what, 99.5% of the time, um, you know, we can capture that. But that's, you know, 0.5% or so that is left uh, tends to harbor quite a, some, quite a bit of some of the things that we're interested in in terms of health, you know. So it's, it's, it makes sense to sample people, not from the point of the uh, social descriptive like race or ethnicity, but from the point of view of history, of human history and migrations, where people have lived, where are the sources of variation likely to have occurred from? Diet, climate, you know, those are the things that shape the genome. 
And sometimes those things coincidentally overlap with our social descriptives of ourselves, but that's really not the purpose. That's not the evolutionary purpose of those, you know. So, for example, if you're interested in kidney disease and the APOL1 gene, for example, you will only see it in the part of Africa that was endemic to trypanosomiasis, the so-called African sleeping sickness. You don't see it in other part of Africa, and you clearly don't see it in Europe or Asia, you know. So it's, it's not even a question of doing Africans. It's a question of doing that part of Africa where they, they, they needed to survive that kind of very dangerous disease. Uh -huh, you know. So for me, it's very, very important for us to appreciate why we do what we do um, and not to overlap it with our social notions that may distort our understanding of human genetic variation. The whole concept of, say, the rare variant, for example, I think if you push that and push it and push it to its limit, it becomes an individual project. You have variants that you may carry that your parents may not carry. Uh -huh, you know? So it's, where, do you, where do you stop and where do you slice this? You know, I think it becomes um, you know, some of the things that you have to consider. Clearly, the more populations we sequence, the more diverse population we sequence, the more we're going to pick up on rare and rare and rare variants. Um, there's absolutely no doubt about that. But we're not doing that from the notion of race or ethnicity. Or, no, we're just doing it. Why do we have rare variants? It started from a place. It has no hard time to spread. Okay? And if that population mates with another population, you know, you may carry that variant. It may start to spread. And then, so something is rare to the point of it's a time thing. You know, the more time, you know, it passes, you know, the more likelihood that that thing will spread you know, to other parts, if there is no gene flow restriction. For, for the phase three, we wanted to make sure that we expand beyond just the continental uh, thinking for the phase one, you know, that, that led us to identify a little over a million, uh, you know, um, uh, markers, you know, in a sense. So we wanted to expand it to other ancestral populations globally, okay? And some of it was convenience, uh, you know, some of it was scientifically strategic uh, in a sense, but really it was trying to say, how do we capture more populations from Europe? You know, how do we capture more populations from Asia? How do we capture more populations from Africa? For example, the African part, you know, uh, that I was engaged in, we wanted to make sure we capture individuals that are from different parts of the, the, um, the, the language group, the major language groups. You know, uh, for example, the Bantu expansions, you know, the Nilo Saharan, you know, we wanted to capture so the, the Maasai, you know, the Luya, the Yoruba. We wanted to expand that in, in a way that we know that some of the uh, evolutionary history of those various populations may have introduced differences that needed to be captured, uh, you know, in a project like the Hat Map. You know, so it was basically trying to involve more global populations. Uh, in, in a way that we can capture more of the variations. I, I think, w for me, one of the major things that it have I'm sure to us is indeed that we are indeed very, very similar uh, as human beings, um, that we share a lot of things, and, and that there are some you know, things that we don't share. And when we, when we um, uh, quantify that, it turned out to be about 10 million you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, that uh, tend to differ, you know, between uh, uh, you know, two individuals or when you compare individuals, uh, you know, so, and that those differences tend to be important when you're talking about health and disease, um, you know, in a sense. So HapMap help us to understand, you know, in a very clear way that a lot of things that we share, and a lot of things, the variation in the human genome is shared, you know, what we call the common variants. They are common, you know, because we share them, you know, and, and it's also based on the fact that the human history is, is indeed very recent. So we still share a lot of um, uh, the variation that we see. So HapMap was very instrumental in, in communicating that message. Uh, it also enabled us to now have a map of where these things are located in the genome and in a way that we can genotype them in a cost-efficient manner and for the very first time, scientists were able to 
interrogate the whole genome instead of specific genes uh, in relation to human disease. That, that is really what is indeed fundamental uh, in biomedical research. Absolutely, you know, it's, it, it is the beginning and is, you know, the, the, the major thing that made uh, GWAS, you know, uh, happen. You know, it, couldn't, it wouldn't have happened without a half map or a similar project, you know, to generate that kind of uh, database that the half map, uh, you know, generated. And half map also gave us understanding of, um, uh, you know, signals of natural selections. Uh, you know, where you could actually look in the genome and you see where the environmental context have shaped the genome uh, in a way that is specific to that part of the world. You know, again, we, we get very good knowledge, you know, from the half map, for example, about something like lysa fever or, or even, you know, uh, skin color or hair color. You know, mm -hmm. those things were, uh, were indeed uh, adequately characterized by with the half map project, yeah. What it has given us is we were able to sample populations that were not part of the heart map or the thousand genome. Okay, so the very first contribution from the African uh, uh, you know, Genome Variation Project is really expanding the level of diversity that we now have in terms of samples and data and understanding of variation across the African continent. So we, again, one of the fundamental things that we need to appreciate and appreciate fully, and we're just beginning to appreciate it very well, is the huge diversity on the African continent. And we needed to sample more and more from the Afri African continent to capture this diversity, okay? Because of language and barriers, you can travel, you know, very, you know, 200 kilometers and be in a completely different environment where you don't understand where the next person is talking in a sense of language. And, and nothing restricts genetics, you know, gene flow, you know, uh, better than language uh, in a sense. So there's a lot of characterization. And of course, humans have lived the longest on that continent. So I've had opportunity to have more variation um, in a sense. So by sequencing and genotyping more African population and putting that in the public domain, we are contributing to the efforts of the half map and the thousand genome in a way, you know, that will serve understanding of disease, uh, genetic basis of disease on the African continent. So that, that is what the variation project is uh, really about, uh, was to expand uh, the African populations that are now available in publicly available database. And then to also, we were able to show also uh, science of natural, you know, uh, selections. Uh, we're able to that resource. We also contribute to uh, genotype in the GWAS array in that we are developing for uh, the H3 Africa or doing research in, in uh, Africa. One of the things that has been very troubling, you know, so people like me and people who study African populations, is that the initial generation of GWAS chips. Uh, not very efficient for African for interrogating African genomes. Uh, again, just because most of the variation and most of the characterization uh, came from European and Asian ancestry populations, so they were not very efficient uh, for African populations. So, by characterizing more Africans uh, populations and then making those data available, and then the bio biotech companies are grabbing this variance and they're putting it on the chip we are now having more efficient African chips. Uh, some of them are uh, newer generation is what I'm using in my lab, you know, as we speak, you know, to, to look at, you know, uh, diabetes and other, other diseases. So we are making these um, um, <coughs> tools more efficient by genotyping more African population. The, the genotyping for the, for the African variation project was actually done at uh, Sanger in the UK. Okay, um, and with our colleagues there uh, in, uh, at the uh, Work Control Sanger uh, Institute in the UK. Uh, but the H3 Africa project, that the Human Heritage and Health in Africa project, is actually putting in place uh, infrastructure to be able to do this kind of genotyping now in Africa. You know, you are beginning to see evidence of that. Uh, so not just doing the uh, the, of finding disease gene, but also creating opportunity for people to understand the technology and be able to use it, you know, locally 
create you know uh, incentive for jobs and also for for training of uh, young men and women um, in, th in this technology yeah. again the fundamental um, vision you know, principle behind the history of Africa uh, is really to empower African investigators to do research about conditions that are important to the continent and to do that research locally and then to be able to analyze it and write the papers and then increase their ability to compete for subsequent funding so that biomedical research can go to a, a, you know, a much higher level uh, on the continent. So that is really the, the, the driving principle behind History Africa. So you now, before History Africa, what you tend to see was African investigators, they don't talk to each other. They talk to people in Europe, to people in America, people in Asia, because they were basically following the money. Uh, now the History Africa is funding in investigators and uh, universities in Africa directly. Uh, so although they can collaborate with whoever they want, but the money goes to the African institution and the African investigator, and they, so therefore empowering them to drive the fundamental questions that they want to, uh, they want to address, that they think is important to their people. The Common Fund is really, it comes out of the uh, director's office, you know, from Francis Collins' office, um, or whoever becomes the director of the NIH. Um, and it's basically direct, is designed to help bring novelty, uh, fund projects that we otherwise uh, not get funded through other mechanism, but to catalyze, you know, biomedical research uh, in a way that uh, is not easily done through the other, you know, mechanism. So it's a very, very you know, wonderful idea. And um, so that's how History Africa is funded because it's, it's really putting, putting aside, uh, you know, a sum of money, uh, allowing African investigators to come up with their own specific questions and apply for that resource. So the Common Fund has been instrumental uh, 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 of course, along with our colleagues from the Welcome Trust in terms of their contribution to this uh, effort. So between the Welcome, uh, Welcome Trust and the Common Funds, uh, the history of Africa has indeed uh, really revolutionized genomic studies on the African continent uh, in a way that would have been otherwise very, very difficult to do. Uh, and, you know, that whole discussion started up, you know, with me and, you know, my leadership with the African Society of Human Genetics, our colleagues there, you know, worried about the fact that African investigators were not participating fully uh, in genomic research, and we, want, we wanted to change that. It is high risk, high reward uh, uh, project. It is because we really don't know how all of this are going to play out with time. Uh, but we are hoping uh, that uh, the initial success stories seems to be pointing in the direction that this is going to be more of reward uh, than risk. Uh, uh, in, in a sense, but it was a really uh, a leap of faith uh, to, to put in this kind of resources and say, let's go for it, uh, you know, in terms of the African continent. And I'm very extremely proud of the fact that the African investigators have stepped up and, and really made us uh, very proud and made this a success story. The East Africa is funding multiple types of um, uh, research. It's funding diabetes research. Uh, which is again in almost in 11 countries now. Uh, it's funding a uh, microbiome uh, project. Uh, it's also looking at cervical cancer uh, on, on the continent and it's looking at cardiometabolic disorders uh, you know, across multiple countries. And there are other you know, conditions like you know, um, you know, trypanosomiasis and also pharmacogenomics you know, in terms of how do we better understand how people respond to, uh, you know, to drugs. Uh, in, the, in the African continent. So it is a really wide, you know, uh, research areas that History Africa is funding. And, um, and we are experiencing some very, very initial good success stories, you know, coming out of this. And it's very important that as we use genetics, genomics to define drugs and design drugs, it is very important that we have to understand uh, the fact that we need to bring all global populations to bear on this. Uh, because we, we know that for reasons that we've talked about earlier, uh, in terms of uh, natural selections, uh, you know, um, and just being in one location versus another for a long time, structures our genome, you know, somewhat differently.
and that we can respond to drugs differently. Um, and therefore, if we don't understand the global implications of human genetic variation in relation to that drug, then we may not fully appreciate the side effects or even the efficacy of such drugs as we go from one community uh, you know, to the other. I, I, the way I sort of phrase it is, will tomorrow's medicine work for all? I think that's really sort of the bottom line. And we have to make sure that it does, you know, that we can make sure that tomorrow medicine will work for all human populations. And, and that um, when it comes to pharmacogenomics, really, uh, as I look at it as going to the tailor. Uh, if you want your clothes to fit, you have to present yourself to the tailor to be measured. If you rely on my measurement, guess what? Your clothes is not going to fit you properly. That is really the bottom line with pharmacogenomics and with the whole concept of precision medicine, that we have to characterize human population as deeply as we can, and at some point, it has to be at the individual level. I think the thousand genome basically built on the half map. Uh, the half map we use you know, technology to, you know, to genotype. You know, um, you know, basically we are putting, you know, identifying things across the genome. Whereas the thousand genome use a combination of these factors, in terms, including sequencing, and basically that allowed us to identify things that we couldn't pick up with the half map. And so we have more detailed, you know, fine grain characterization of human genetic variation. Instead of like 3.1 million, we are talking about over 80 million uh, variants being identified uh, with the last uh, publication of, of the sequencing of over 2,500 individuals uh, with the thousand genome. So I again, all of this, one of the things I've appreciated about the, the genome effort, starting from the sequencing of the human genome, is really the appreciation of the fact that we need to start somewhere and then build on that and build on that and I continue to build on this. Sometimes some people see that as a criticism, but I think I see that as a realistic way of approaching a major, major biomedical initiative. And I think the success so far seems to have supported that strategy of continuing to build. So we said 1,000 genome, but we end, the final paper actually sequenced over 2,500 individuals uh, because, again, we know the, the more we sequence, the more we're going to be able to capture these variations, especially the rare ones, um, and, and they have a much broader and deeper, finer map of the human genetic variation. So, again, one of the things that the 1,000 genome is doing for us, is, even in the context of GWAS, is we now have a much more um, uh, comprehensive reference panel for imputation. What do I mean by imputation? That is basically, when we, when we do uh, GWAS and we use this uh, genotyping arrays, you know, there are gaps, okay? So, and the typical one may give you like 2 million, you know, SNPs. But if you do imputation and you fill in those gaps using that reference panel, you can get up to 20 million. And that just increases your power to find genes, you know, uh, in relation to disease and health. The bioinformatics, I think, without that, we will not be, we will, we will be nowhere, really. Uh, because you can sequence all you want if you don't have the tools and the know-how to interrogate that sequence and characterize them in a way that people can interact with it. You really, all you have is just a mess of data on your computer. Uh, so the bioinformatics tools that were developed from the half map, the thousand genome, has really, really enabled us to have a much better appreciation of human genetic variation and how to relate that you know, to disease. So that is fundamental delivery uh, when it comes to uh, the thousand genome or even the half map you know, project. Uh, that bioinformatics strategy and, you know, real strong computational uh, biology uh, understanding um, and very clever people, uh, you know, who are able to interrogate and design, you know, uh, software uh, that will help us to interrogate this kind of huge data that you really cannot, uh, it's not your uh, typical Excel spreadsheet, you know, that you put this kind of data on. So you really need people who understand bioinformatics and also you know, uh, computational, uh, you know, work and how to design software. 
it's really you cannot um, overemphasize, you know, the role of a bioinformatician. It's just it's, it's central uh, to you know to all of this. So otherwise, you just have a blob of data, and and you just you can make head or tail out of it. Is the annotation of that data, making sense of that data, and putting it in a way that people can use it. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, if the hap map data wasn't friendly, nobody would go there, nobody would use it. Uh, so to be able to structure it in a way that somebody in Africa or in China can log on and be able to download that data and be able to use it with clear documentation of what has been done uh, is just is, is absolutely fantastic. You know, for me, I think it's important for us to appreciate, you know, projects like HapMap, the Tazan Genome, and the African Genome Variation, in, you know, History Africa, because of what they do. They tend to revolutionize our ability. They give us tools that we will otherwise not have if we don't have those kind of international effort. People coming together uh, from different parts of the world to say we need to develop uh, a human good uh, you know, that everybody can use to understand biomedical research. Absolutely. I think it, it, it will be tragic if we go through all of this and we exacerbate disparity instead of making disparity go away, you know. So I think by representing different human populations and being careful about the way we interpret the results, uh, I think we would indeed share light on, on human history, how we relate it, and our, our human health, you know, uh, in, in a way that we couldn't do before.